Hello, I am Michael Gaucher, and I'm building a RSS reader application in Microsoft Windows 11 using the .NET Framework, C Sharp, WPF, and all of that is going to connect to SQL Server. We're doing all of this on a low-end computer, or what people would call a low-end computer, using an Intel Pentium processor with four gigabytes of RAM. I did upgrade the hard drive to a, a 500 gigabyte Samsung SSD in 2019. And so this computer is a few years old with low end hardware specs. And it's interesting to see how this, this process uh, unfolds in this environment. And so in defining the window for this program, the layout is coming along quite well. There are no major roadblocks we have API documentation through Microsoft Help Viewer that is showing us what the definitions are in terms of functions and properties that we need to access through Microsoft WPF using C Sharp to produce the visual output that we intend. Keep in mind that when we're talking about intention, we have requirements in the form of a screenshot from a program in Linux that I am creating here in Microsoft Windows. And so the goal is to get this layout to a point where we can connect to data in the SQL Server database, get data out of the SQL Server database, get that data into the program such that we can then drive the user interface off of the data, right? And my uh, way of going about that is to think ahead and think smartly. And that is, I don't want a commingling of data and user interface code in the same area. I'm not a totally opposed to that. There are cases for that, right? Um, I try not to be so rigid and inflexible with software development that I miss the opportunities to uh, do things in the most efficient way for the situation. And so there are some situations where you need to commingle those things, but in most cases you do not, and it's recommended that you do not, so that you have what they call separation of concerns, where it's easier to classify uh, what you're doing in one part of the program and treat that according to the best practices and concepts for um, that concept, right? Um, and so in this case, I'm going to take that data process and I'm going to encapsulate that in a class, right? Of its own type, right? So this is kind of like a bridge class. It's gonna bridge between, It's that's a design pattern, right? We're gonna bridge between the user interface and the data. And some would say, yeah, um, model view controller always shows itself everywhere in software i mean when you start um, delineating software systems between front end middle tier and back end on some level whether you uh, whether or not you have actual servers uh, in place or you're just looking at the structure of the program in, in, a, in a particular um, uh, part of the overall system, ecosystem, um, you can make a case that MVC is the predominant uh, design pattern in software development for organization for bringing real order to software applications. And so that's what I do here so that the actual data uh, class types, the data, the data types for uh, the SQL Server data, right, the representations of that in a C Sharp program um, can be accessed through this bridging mechanism, which has all of the logic for communicating with SQL Server and translating that SQL Server uh, TDS, that tabular data stream, into a, a, a format uh, such as a sorted list um, collection with uh, feed and feed article data types. And so that the user interface, all it has to worry about is accessing this bridge uh, data type and then 
getting the data that it needs directly from that data type. And then, oh look, it's the cat down the road. And then uh, using that to um, make the user interface what we want it to be based off of the data. And what that means is, so we have these uh, feeds, these RSS feeds. A feed is synonymous with a website, okay? So I need to know the list of websites that I'm interested in. And then I want a tab for each website. And then when I click on the tab, I want um, the headlines for that website to actually show up underneath that tab. And then when I click on a headline, I want the article content for that headline to show up on the right side um, of the screen. And so that's uh, the general process that we're looking for. And all of that is, is not something you fake. That's something that is based off of real data. And so if the data doesn't exist, then the headline doesn't exist, right? Um, if the feed doesn't exist, then, you know, the, the tab doesn't exist. And so that's how the data is going to define the user interface. And then we put our own parameters on that in such that we say, well, a feed is associated with a tab. And then a headline is associated with a entry in a list box and then when that list box entry is clicked then that's associated with a a uh, document type that's going to render HTML for us and so I've done this process literally hundreds of times uh, that is not an exaggeration I spent well over 10,000 to 15,000 approaching 20,000 hours of time 20,000 hours writing code and within that 20,000 hours there's a subset of code that I've written that is common to many of the uh, software programs that I work with and so for for .NET programs the type of code that you're going to see here is the type of code that I used uh, predominantly since um, the inception of .NET that coincided with my use of .NET. So, um, so I say that to say that um, usually when you're building a new program, there's a tendency to write a little bit of code, run the program, see how you're doing, you know, and then use that feedback to refine what you've written, write a little bit more code, run the program. And I total, totally recommend that. You really should do that. Um, because of my experience level and um, having dealt with this particular way of building .NET programs, I'm going a more expedited realm. And so I don't want you to think that the way that I'm doing it here is the way you should do it. I'm writing all this code, just spinning it out, and I'm referring to documentation and I'm spinning out code. And then at a later time, I'm going to run the whole thing and um, see where the bugs are, where the flaws are, that sort of thing. Um, and so instead of doing code, debugger, code, debugger, code, debugger, doing it like that in a cycle, I'm just going to do code, API documentation, code, and then do the debugger later on so that um, I can work through the, the creation of the code um, in a more um, seamless way as a more getting as close to I can as a single train of thought and um, as I do this um, the user interface application will begin to unfold but not yet uh, we have to focus on the data and so this is data binding part one where we are working towards getting SQL server data into this WPF.net um, software program written in C-sharp. I used the help viewer program to learn that the tab control class is what I need in order to establish tabs. And I've already put that tab control um, into place. And so I declared uh, a variable where I'm going to instantiate an instance of the tab control class. And I have my SQL Server connection here where I will um, pull back from the database the list of RSS feeds that I, I will use to generate those tabs.
So this is a manual form of data binding that I'm going to use here. And this will assist me in getting the user interface set up from a tab standpoint. I'm going to draw uh, from the data conversion program where I essentially uh, go through this same process of going through um, RSS feeds in order to put data into the database. We're doing the opposite of that in this case, but the process is very similar between inducting data into the database and getting that data back out, right? The same data elements are involved. So I go through the data conversion program to refamiliarize myself with the approach taken there where we went through each individual feed and each individual feed article to effect the proper induction of the data into the SQL Server database. I'm going to use this same structure with substantial modifications when pulling the data back out of the database. And so here are two good examples here where we're inserting the feed and we're inserting the feed article. And I will use those as a starting point for getting the same kind of data out of the database and building up the data objects. Now in the intro to this video, I mentioned having a mediating class that's going to deal with this. And so this mediating class is the appropriate place for this particular type of code. So let's establish a new class right here, right now, so that we don't have to worry about that later. And again, this class is going to hold the functions and the functionality needed to get data out of the database. And in a more um, developed scenario, let's say, let's say we were actually accepting input from this program, this class could also handle po posting data from the user interface into the database. And so let's get the right declarations in place. We know from our data conversion program what those uh, class types will be, right? What those namespaces will be. And we can use those same approaches from the data conversion program. We can use that in the user interfaces data access layer, so to speak. So this will be very familiar here. Going to set up a sequence structure that will have all the feeds that we're returning back from the database. This function that we have here, get feeds, basically we're going to get all the feeds. And because of the amount of data that we're dealing with here, this is entirely appropriate. So we want the ability to access our database. And if you notice from before, we already have the connection string, right? So the connection string is in place. And you'll notice that in the data conversion program, I refer to the columns through a, a function that was dedicated to that, right? I'm going to do something slightly different here where the columns are defined in the settings file. So I can enumerate the columns that are used in this particular instance, and I can encode those into the settings file. You can go either way with that. I actually prefer the settings file approach because that is much more flexible, but the, the pros of going with it encoded in the program itself 
by way of the, let's say, in the class. And of course, the settings file is going to use a class as a backing store, as part of its uh, um, backing store process. But uh, by having it in a class rather than a settings file, you have much more resiliency in your program such that you know damage to a externalized settings file doesn't cause headaches uh, with the with the program running so again you can go either way i want to demonstrate both approaches now the list of columns are the same between the conversion program and the sql server database and the user interface so that's the advantage we have here. Note tab plus plus will help us basically put the list of columns in a form that is more suitable for the settings class, right? For the settings um, part of the project. So we have all of the columns listed now and we can move on to the next step in this process. By the way, I can keep the same interface as I did in the data conversion program for accessing the column names by having a facade method here that is going to uh, relay requests for the columns to the appropriate settings property. But the semantics for accessing that in the other parts of the code is the same, exactly the same as it would be if we were doing this in the data conversion program. Also, what all of this demonstrates is the value of getting your data conversion process correct so that you have the lessons learned and you have the reference for doing similar things in a user interface. Let's take a look at this API documentation I have given such high praise for. The help viewer lets us go through the various class types and interfaces that we are interested in for the various things that we want to do in the software code. And it's very easy to navigate. Well, on a scale of one to 10, I give it about an eight. I give it an eight. It would only get a 10 if like in previous versions of the help viewer, there was much better control over the language that you want to um, have example for. You had much better control over the part of the overall APIs that you want. What I mean by that is you could end up with situations where let's say you want to find a button class well, that button class could be defined in any number of frameworks. And it would be nice to have a better filtering process where if all I am interested in is WPF, then show me user interface objects that are related to WPF and not Windows Forms and ASP.NET and all of that. But I'll take what I can get. This is still more convenient than constantly going online and accessing the same information there. Even on normal .NET matters, here I use the documentation to make sure I can take the collection that was in the settings file and pre-populate an instance of a, a list type. And so through its constructor, and that was very, very useful. So here we have the, um, the emerging definition of the function method for getting all of the feed data and the feed article items out of the database and bringing that into the user interface through this data feed data exchange class that we have established here. And so passing in the SQL connection and it's going to update the passed in feed article or feed article or RSS feed item. And that is going to be one way to do an update, but that's not really the way we want to do that. We need to modify that so that um, it's 
even more useful by updating a collection. I just did Control Shift B to build the, the entire solution so that I can see if there's any syntax error somewhere that I missed or there was some other issue there. So um, that's what I, I have here. And so that's what I did is I did Control Shift B and that ran and it compiled everything just to see what um, see if everything was uh, defined correctly. So I found a few issues and you correct those in place. And I'm going to use a factory method here to get the SQL connection. And that will save a, a little bit of coding so that we don't have SQL connection declarations all over the place. It's just a small little convenience. And I'm really interested to uh, get the collections populated because that's where the, the real action happens. And you gotta get rid of these execute non-queries because when you're inserting, yes, you're executing non-query, but when you're bringing back data, you're executing query. So gotta make that modification there. And fortunately here, we won't need parameters, so we can forego parameters. So there are a number of things that need to occur through our feed data exchange uh, class so that when the program accesses that class, and I'm probably going to do factory methods or, a, or static methods, and go in that direction so that things are a little more convenient in terms of how the program flows and how the program sequence is organized. So we have did a bit of copy and paste here. I'm not really a fan of copy and paste, but sometimes you, know, you, can, you can get a little bit of a boost there. You just always have to remember with copy and paste that everything one size does not fit all and that you can end up with some serious errors with copy and paste so you gotta you, the best thing to do is to scrutinize what you've copied and pasted line by line to make absolutely sure that everything fits in the new place where you've pasted the the information so the glaring issue here is that we don't have our collection, our our collection, and I'm going to use a, a a dictionary type. I'm going to use an associative associative array approach to this process, as I did in the data conversion program. So, if you're coming into this video fresh and um, you haven't seen videos three through six, videos three through six those videos explain what we are referring to with the data conversion program. That's a prerequisite to where we've gotten to here. So I'm going to set up the, the, the collection that I need because that's the ultimate objective of this particular function and functions like it. So get feed items and get feed articles, right? For article items. We need a primary collection that will be returned back to the caller of the function, right? And so in this case, that's going to be feeds. And you can do that any number of ways. You can pass in the collection to be updated, or you can just return a, a fresh collection. And at this point, I'm going to go with the latter. And so um, the, the structure of this program is completely proper. It's the little tweaks we need to make so that it's adapted properly for returning data to the um, the, the sequences of code in the user interface that's going to call or dispatch this function. Notice that the command text get is equal to get all feeds. So we have the right store procedure that we're going to use. And we now have our, our associative uh, type and we're now just getting the other pieces of the code to, to correspond and to match. And so once the type definitions are uh, uniform from the definition of the function to the body of the function and to 
uh, the return part where we return to the call site, then we have what we need in place to make this a success. So the getting this function done correctly, you would think that I could use that pretty much verbatim in the get feed articles um, function, but that's not the case because they, they differ so much in the details in terms of their columns are different, right? And the stored procedure that's used is different, but the structure of the programs are, the structure of the functions are the same. So in principle, you could use a generic function that would mediate between the two different processes it would, where we could mediate between. And notice my little note there, um, how cool it would be where if we had the using statement in .NET, where it would be structured almost like uh, your, for, your for loop, right? In your for loop, you can actually modify your for loop so that you have your your preamble and you have your your counter, right? You have your evaluation condition and you can do things with that um, where it's more succinct and more compact, but um, those are um, wishes for other days. The code for get feed items is practically done at this point. There's probably a few more tweaks that needs to be made at some point. And it's time to turn the focus on get feed articles so that we have both functions ready to go. In typical fashion, it makes sense to scan through the get feed items function. And as I had mentioned before, the functions are very similar and you'll see that I copied and pasted over the body of get feed article items. That is somewhat controversial. I've done it for a very long time, but every time I do it, it's like, you know, I got all the right column names in place and I now just overwrote all of that because I'm now just gonna redo the column names because getting the overall structure correct is more important than having already defined the column names in the correct sequence. And again, this is one way of doing uh, data definitions, data access processes. There are dozens of ways to do that in .NET. We haven't even touched on entity framework and language integrated queries, right? But I found that when going through a process, it's helpful to work through it in this, this way and in this style. And then you can refine in other directions if that's appropriate. And of course, with this approach that I've taken here, you have much greater control over the performance of the data access code. And so that's going to be the chief reason why you would want to approach it this way. You gain greater control over that data access process compared to many other, other approaches and alternatives that you could take in Microsoft.net. Knowing that I have the columns set up the way that I want in the data conversion program, I can use that so that overwriting the function definition as I did earlier is not such a, a huge deal in this case. So I can move I can copy the, the column sequences from the data conversion program uh, for get feed articles, right? So that not only do I have a structure that matches between get feed items and get feed article items, right? I now have the right column definitions for each function that I've defined. And in the same way, I need to define the associative definition, associative collection definition that I will be using for get feed article items so that we have the right structure being returned to the user interface. I know some have said in the past that I make this look very easy, but 
it is a process that you know anyone can do and all you have to do is just um, stay consistent and stay focused on the principles of uh, data structuring and getting your, your data structures where you want them to be, how you want to access the data, and then putting in place the algorithmic approach for accessing and retrieving that data and moving that data through the program. And here I have a few control checks so that I can ensure that data goes where it's supposed to go. There is actually going to be a bug here that I discover later on, but that's not important at this point to emphasize. What's important now is to make sure that the structure of the function is correct. And here we do have the correct structure. And it's just a matter of making use of that structure in the user interface. So that part of the program that's actually going to show the tabs, right? Show the tabs and then show the headlines. That's the part of the program that's going to make use of these functions. And so it is vitally important that these functions bring back accurate information. These functions is where the database is accessed and the information that is in the database is then converted to data that sits in the memory, sits in RAM. That all happens in this function. And then this function is responsible for presenting a version of the data in terms of the format of the data in a form that the part of that program that is going to present this, this data to the screen on screen is done in a way that is somewhat seamless. I've updated the definition for the data that's coming back from this function, get feed articles items, so that I can access the data in a variety of ways. Partition it by RSS feed name first, and then partition it based on the actual article. And the reason why that second part is important is so that when a headline is clicked, then it's a simple matter of accessing the article based on the URL, the headline. You can actually go either way, but I prefer the URL because the URLs are typically going to be unique. And then I can access the article content that goes with that headline and show that on the screen. So in that way, I have simplified the way the data, I've simplified the way the program is going to work by putting a little bit of complexity on the data side that simplifies everything else. I am extremely pleased with how this is going, by the way. And so we need to make a few more refinements to feeds feed article items. And once we have those refinements in place, then we will be in a better place to move on to the next step.